So color vision, how many of you have that? <clears throat> okay. If you don't have it, you're not going to be able to see. There's a question printed right here. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right in that box. Um, if you have perfect color vision, you'll be able to see that question. If you don't, um, um, it's a rather invasive question, though. Wouldn't you say? It is. It, it, it is, Alex. Uh, you know, but it's it's for research. Uh, All right. Some learning objectives. Hey. Uh, why is color important? This is pretty, pretty great. How many of you read that book, uh, read the part of the book about the guy who lost all of his color vision and everything that he saw was like gray colored? Um, and everything was like colored like a rat. So when, <laughs> I know that's awful, right? Um, and he was, so he would like walk around and everything was the same color as a rat. Kind of saw stuff in grayscale, which was, was kind of gross for him. Uh, what was really bad was food, right? How many of you love those rat-colored cheeseburgers? Oh, yeah. uh, I know, right? Those are phenomenal, right? Uh, the only things that he could eat were things that were black and white. So if he were to get some olives or some rice, coffee, yogurt, those things seemed to be really great for him because they, were, they would show up the colors he anticipated them to be, uh, not some other color that looked kind of gross and, and unappealing, right? How many of you have ever... Um, we're coming up on that season when everybody thinks everything needs to be green, right? It's the worst idea ever. Uh, how many of you have had like green flavored foods that aren't supposed to be green? You're just like, oh, that's kind of gross. Yeah, right. And it's not it's just like food coloring doesn't change the doesn't change the actual flavor at all, but just that visual appearance, right? It's pretty bad. <clears throat> so color's pretty important, right? It's great for determining if things are ripe. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, we, uh, you know, descended from fruit-eating species, right? It's kind of nice to know if that that fruit is ripe or not. How many of you have ever bitten into an unripe banana? Yeah, that's nasty. Or a pear. You could lose a tooth on a pear. If it's not, if it's not ready, they're like rocks. Yeah. They're not ready, right? <clears throat> uh, there's some other theory about the importance of color. Uh, there are some folks who think um, it's important for sort of uh, mating purposes. There are a number of species that turn certain parts of their bodies bright red during, uh, you know, when, when they're sort of fertile and receptive to that. Uh, so obviously being able to notice if uh, some part of another person's body or another conspecific, what we call another member of your species, uh, turned bright red all of a sudden, you know, that, that would be pretty important to you. So. Uh, just a couple reasons why. Color vision might be important. The uh, sort of caveat to that is like, well, why don't all species have color vision, right? Um, if it's important for finding foods that aren't spoiled. Well, I mean, humans and, and, and primates and, and those of us who descended from sort of that branch of things, we really heavily rely on vision as opposed to other sensory capabilities, right? So if you think about a dog, for example, they don't necessarily have great color vision. They've got a phenomenal olfactory system. Uh, they've got a digestive system that uh, might be able to handle them eating some things that are, uh, you know, things that we wouldn't eat necessarily. So I don't know if you, how many if you have a dog and you've tried to, like, have to pull things out of its mouth that are, you know, not things you really want to touch with your hands and you definitely wouldn't want to stick in your mouth. Right. Ironically, my dog uh, puts most things in his mouth that we don't want to touch with our hands because they hurt. We have a chestnut tree out beside our house, and he always grabs them and tries to bring them in. Those are fun to try and yank out of his mouth without actually touching. Wow. I would imagine that would be painful. So would I. Huh. But he keeps doing it. I, I guess he, like, grabs it with his teeth instead of his actual mouth. My right, dog right. Likes rocks. He Your dog likes rocks? Rocks and mulch okay. are his favorite things. Huh. This is why we don't let dogs fly spaceships. Absolutely. Or a boat. No. Or a boat. Yeah, dogs don't get a boat. <laughs> you never know. All right, uh, so what do we mean by spectral properties of light? Hey, uh, did, did we already talk about this? I think we did, right? The electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Again, we're only dealing with this sliver from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Okay, not a big deal. Color, the thing we want to keep in mind is color is not a property of the stimulus. It's something that we construct through perception, right? So uh, things that appear red, it's not because they are red. 
It's because they have a wavelength of light closer to 700 nanometers. That's why they appear red, right? They appear red to us. That's how our brain uh, receives that information and processes that and makes that perception, right? So it's not red light. It's not blue light. It's not green light, right? We have to think about what are the wavelengths. How do we perceive that, okay? In a few moments, we'll talk a bit about cones. A lot of folks will tell you you have red, green, and blue cones, right? Sensitive cones, you don't. You have cones that are sensitive to long, medium, or short wavelengths of light, okay? And you just perceive each of those as red, green, or blue. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. All right, here's this sort of perceptual color space. If you were to ask someone to sort of think about what are the basic colors, right? And, and this has been done across a number of cultures. Uh, folks will typically come up with green, blue, red, and yellow, and then there's kind of this dark to uh, bright sort of axis as well, right? So you can go uh, in different directions there. If you think about this a little bit, green, is there any way to break down, like if you were gonna describe green to someone, um, is there any way to kind of describe that as something that's like, you know, breaking down green into something else. It's, it's kind of... the yellow combined. Right, but you wouldn't describe green as a blue-yellow or a yellow-blue. Purple you might describe as a red-blue, right? Or, uh, or pink you might describe as a desaturated red. Uh, but green, you know, you probably wouldn't find people describing that as a, you know, blue-yellow or a yellow-blue. And even if you said to someone, if I said to you just conceptually, green is equal parts blue and yellow, I don't know if you, you know, if, if you were to just take the two of those together, does, does green even seem to be what you would predict to come out of that, right? Probably not. Uh, same kind of story with blue, yellow, and red, right? These are sort of the basic um, sort of fundamental colors. When we talk about color, we really are wanting to talk about some different characteristics. <clears throat> the first is going to be hue. Hue's going to be related to, to the primary wavelength that's present in that color, right? So if it's a longer wavelength, it's going to be more red. If it's a shorter wavelength, it's going to be up here more blue. If it's somewhere in the middle, we're going to kind of describe that as green, okay? The next thing that we have is called saturation, right? So again, if you think about red and pink, right? So the primary wavelength in pink is still going to be that same wavelength we find in red. There are just a lot of other wavelengths in there as well that are desaturating that, right? Instead of getting that uh, just one wavelength that's red, you're getting a bunch of other wavelengths in there as well that desaturate that. So would that be like how vivid it is? How vivid it is? Um, that's a slightly different property, but way to predict what's next, Eli. Uh, that's gonna be lightness or brightness or intensity. Right? And that's how we would describe that, right? Is it uh, brighter or uh, you know, less bright? That, it's kind of hard sometimes to go between saturation and lightness, right? And if we really wanted to get into this, we probably won't. Uh, you can take colors that are desaturated, and often they will appear to be a different brightness than something that's fully saturated, even though they might appear at the same brightness, right? Because of that sort of overlap there between those qualities. So if you had a, a red and then you had a pink, someone might judge the red as more luminant when in fact it may not be because the pink is desaturated. Right? So you can get a little tripped up there sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So many of you uh, are familiar with what we call subtractive color mixing, right? So when you mix different dyes or pigments together, each of those is going to absorb a particular wavelength and reflect others. Whatever is being reflected is what uh, what you would you know what would reach your eye. That's really great for uh, you know making paints for your house or your art projects. Doesn't really tell us much about how your visual system actually works, right? Because your visual system works through a different uh, system. So here's kind of the graph. For subtractive color mixing, not a big deal, right? And you can sort of see what happens. Uh, this is sort of your standard, uh, you know, you've got your 
something in the yellow, something in the blue, and then something sort of in the in the red family, and you can add these together in different ways. In fact, uh, your visual system, though, works on what we call additive color mixing, right? And you can see that these two, even though they look similar, they produce completely different colors when they're mixed together, right? So here, uh, to get green, we kind of had blue and yellow. Green over here is sort of its own thing because we have a, a wavelength of light through a cone that's sensitive to that wavelength of light, okay? So we do want to talk a little bit about this idea of metamers, right? Because today we're going to do, uh, one of the activities we're going to do is something that's similar to metamers, kind of uh, simulates that. So, and you said this is how we, how we mostly see color? Yeah, this, this is how your, your visual system processes color. So for a metamer, the idea is basically I can take any pure wavelength of light, and then I can take two other wavelengths of light, or three wavelengths of light, and I can add those and mix those together in some proportion that will equal and appear to you to be the same as that original wavelength of light. Right? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then there's a diagram here that hopefully makes more sense, right? So metamers, it's pairs of light. They do have different wavelengths but they appear identical. Now, I've kind of told you this story, Kyle, that it's the wavelength of light that's important that you perceive, right? But now what I'm telling you is it's not just one wavelength of light, it's sort of the combined total of these wavelengths of light, right? How that activates your cones differently. And we're going to talk about something um, at length called cone excitation ratios. Okay, this is going to be an important concept that we're going to visit uh, several times today. So if you want to write down CER in the biggest font possible, and then underline it four times, and put at least two stars and a smiley face next to it. I'll give you guys time to do that. Great. Good job, Chloe. I think Chloe actually did that. I, I can't see from here. I just did big letters. You just did big letters, so that's close enough. So cone excitation, I'm going to assume that's what you did. My, my eyes are that great, Eli, I can see in the dark all the way across the room. Yeah. I just didn't know that. So cone excitation ratios, basically the idea is if I excite just my you know, short wavelength or long wavelength sensitive cones, that's fine. But if I activate all of my others in some sort of particular ratio, I can get the same result, right? Does that make sense? It'll make sense later. Remember we said sometimes you just have to wait until the carousel comes back around, right, Gabby? So just wait, get a little bit of cotton candy. It's coming right back around, I promise. All right, so basically what we do is for metamers, you have a test color, and it's got a single wavelength of white, one wavelength at all. And it's going to appear as a certain color to you, right? Let's say that color is yellow. How many of you like the color yellow? Great, two of you. Okay. So the color yellow, right? What we do next is we take some primaries, right? Let's say for example, red and green. We take a red light and a green light. Okay? As we saw back here, you can mix red and green and you can get yellow, right? Okay. When we're additive color mixing. So what we do is we take a red light and a green light and we flash them on this spot and we let you Tabby, you're just going to turn the knobs on the red and the green light until you mix them in a certain way and mix their intensities in a way that that patch is the same yellow as the single wavelength patch, right? Does that make sense? If you don't have a color deficit, you'll be able to take uh, no more than three primary sources of light and mix those to make any color. The cool thing about this is, once you've made that match, if you add a wavelength of light to the test color or to the standard color, you know, whichever two you've got, if you add the same wavelength of light, they'll both shift, and then they'll still appear to be this equal colors. They'll be different colors, right, because you've added a wavelength of light. So let's say we've got this great example here. 
Here's the test wavelength. It's that yellow color. We're going to take a red, a green, and a blue light. We're going to mix these until we get a match. Once we get a match, that's awesome. We're all excited, right? So we can dial those three in to equal this one single wavelength of light. If I add a wavelength of light to this, and it now appears orange, and I add the same wavelength of light to this single wavelength, it will also appear orange. So they'll both still match as long as we have the same wavelength of light to each of those, uh, the test and the uh, standard. Does that make sense? So we can think about this in terms of, uh, remember we talked about all those fun wavelengths when we talked about uh, sound, right? So let's say we have a, a frequency of sound, right? We have a wavelength and that makes a certain pitch. If we have a couple other wavelengths, we can add those together, right? And maybe we can make that same noise. That's awesome. So now we've got sort of two equal sounds. If we add a wavelength on top of both of those, it's still going to sound the still going to sound the same, even though they're shifting where they're located. Does that make sense to everybody? So you understand, just go around and nod everyone else's head for me so I know everybody understands, okay? Go ahead, you, you can take five minutes to do that. No, not gonna do it, that's fine. Uh, don't worry about this chromaticity diagram. Uh, there's a little shaded area here. Most of what you see on your like TVs and computers or whatever, it's going to fall into this range. Uh, most of that works fairly well. You get out in some of these other areas, it's sort of expensive. I like how the first line you drew was so perfectly straight and along the line, and then the rest of the triangle was just completely off. Yeah. Well, you know, you can't repeat perfection. <laughs> uh, but don't worry about this diagram too much. You guys have probably seen something similar. Who's the art minor? Let me say, major? You're a dual major? Mm -hmm. Or just a major? I'm a dual major. With psych as your other major? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to drop? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> just thought I'd ask. <laughs> You've probably seen a diagram like this quite a bit, right? Just nod your head. Maybe at one point, yeah. Okay. Uh, just don't worry about any of this. Hey, guess what this diagram's about? Explaining metamorphism using trichromacy. That's close. That's not bad. Uh, that's what the title says. Oh. So I'll give you credit for that. Uh, I said something a few moments ago, though. And I said this was really important, and you should probably write it in big letters. CER. Yeah, CER. Yeah, yeah. This is cone excitation ratios, right? Okay. That's what that's what we're talking about here. So. Here's basically how metamers work, right? If, you're, if you see something and you perceive it as red, right? So we have three kinds of cones. We've got short wavelength sensitive cones, medium wavelength sensitive cones, and long wavelength sensitive cones, okay? Those pretty much map on to the perceptions of blue, green, and red. That's why we, we put them in those colors, okay? Blue, green, and red. When you see something that you perceive as red, all right, so as we see in this first set of bar graphs, obviously those long wavelength cones need to be really excited by that, right? So that's awesome. Now, your medium and your short wavelength cones get a little bit excited there as well. I'm going to be really impressed if somebody can throw this word out to me. A while back, I talked to you about the likelihood of a cone absorbing a photon of light. Right? And I said it's dependent upon a, a few things, the wavelength of the photon and the um, angle at which the photon enters the retina, right? Anybody remember that word for that particular phenomenon when uh, after you absorb a photon of light, you don't know what wavelength it actually was, you just perceive it as the wavelength of the cone that absorbed it? It's called univariance. Now everybody remembers it. Uh, no, nobody. It's called univariance. So some of this is going to be due to univariance, right? Like different photons, even though they might be long wavelengths, kind of hitting the, the medium and the short wavelengths, uh, cones, sensitive cones just right. Okay. So 
Obviously, if those long wavelength cones are more excited than anything else, we're going to perceive that as red. If the medium wavelength cones are more excited, then we're going to perceive that as green. Right? If we send you out a single wavelength of light that you perceive as yellow, this is the pattern of excitation that you get. Right? Medium and long wavelength cones are pretty excited by that. And your short wavelength cones get a little bit excited. That makes sense, right? Now, if I take this red and this green, and I give you both of those at the same time, look at the pattern of excitation here. We get a lot of excitation in the long and medium. And relatively speaking, a little bit of ex excitation in the short wavelength cones, right? So this relationship from here to here is the same as the relationship from here to here. We're not looking at absolute units, we're looking at the ratio, right? So this is a cone excitation ratio. Does that make sense? Okay. Doesn't matter how much a particular cone type is excited, it matters how much it's excited in relation to the other cone types, right? So it's like uh, grading an exam on a curve, okay? If all of you, if I give you an easy test and all of you do really well, do I really know anything? But what if I give you a really hard test and some of you do sort of very poorly and then a couple of you do really well? Right? It's that X, it's the difference, it's that ratio, right? Okay, that's important. It's not absolute value, it's ratio. I feel like that was a foreshadowing. I don't like that. That's why I don't read books. That's why you do, yeah, don't read books, waste of time. But foreshadowing, yeah, don't do it. Don't do yeah. That. No. You should always start books at the back. What? Always start reading books in the back. Yeah, on the very back cover? Yeah, back cover, that's where you read it. We'll just tell you how great the book was. Anybody not understand this excitation ratio business? Will it be presented on the test? Yes. How? <laughs> Explain <laughs> cone excitation ratios okay. in relation to metamers. Okay. Right? And all you would have to say is, it's not important how much any individual cone type is excited. It's important how much more is it excited than other cone types. That's all I have to say. Well, that's not probably all. Oh, okay. But, 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 that, <laughs> okay. but that would that wow. would get you that would get you a pretty good amount of credit for that, right? Because that's really what's important. It's not did the short wavelength cones get excited or did the long wavelength cones get excited? How excited did the other cones get? Right? You have to know that. Because if all the cones are really excited, well I, then and I go, well tell me what, what color I'm seeing, and they're all three way up here, and you only look at the red, you're like, oh, you're seeing red. And somebody says, oh, no, you're seeing green. And somebody's like, oh, no, you're seeing blue. Well, you know, what's really coming in is because you're adding all three together, you're seeing white light, right? Because we can go back to this additive business and see when you add all three. So, uh, so it's, more, it's more how much did one specific cone get excited? Would that be a good way to put it? In relation, to the other yeah. in relation to the other cones. Okay, in relation to the other cones. That's yeah. what different, differentiates the different stimulus, how you acquire the different stimulus, right? Right, right, because that, because it's... Or perceive the different stimulus. Yeah, say. because if the light is bright enough, I mean, like all light's going to contain some other, typically, going to contain some other wavelengths of light, right? And if it's intense enough, then all of your cones will get really excited, right? But it's how much more did, does one cone type still get excited, even if you've cranked up the intensity of the light. So if if we are seeing all, if, you know, if all those cones are being excited, then we perceive it as white, is that right. what you're saying? So if we drop the bars down like all the way to like almost zero, would it just be black? It's still gonna be white. Okay. It's not gonna be as bright. So brightness is kind of a separate dimension. But because they're still all three equally activated, it doesn't matter what the intensity is, if all three are equally activated, you're going to perceive that as okay, white. I understand. So this is just basically how we perceive metamers? 
Yeah. Okay. So, like, you don't want to look at how the cones, how each, of, how much each of the cones are excited individually. To know what color you're perceiving, you have to know how excited the other cones are in relation to. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So like, because you said like the same thing that's happening with the red green is the same thing that's happening with the yellow, is what's the difference? Like, are you still seeing yellow with the red green? Because I'm pretty sure we were talking about something earlier and you said like, if we put red and green together, you get yellow. Was, did, did we say that? Or yeah, am I? Exactly. So yeah. what's up with that? Well, so here's exactly what happens. It, this is just exciting, mostly you're a long way Right, you're getting a little bit of excitation here, but not much. <laughs> here you're mostly exciting medium, you're getting a little bit here, but not much, right? If both the long and the medium cones are excited equally, you'll perceive that as yellow. Not red, not green, but you'll perceive it as yellow. Because again, it's that relation. Normally you would say, oh, well if the medium is really excited, then it's going to be green that I perceive. Well, this is an example where the medium wavelength cones are really excited, but you're not perceiving green because the long wavelength cones are also really excited. So I guess my question is, is in the red green, what are we seeing? Are we seeing red and green? Like, do you know what I'm trying to say? I understand what you're trying to say. Well, she's asking what the difference is between the yellow oh, and the red, red and green. These two? Yeah, yeah, like what are we actually Nothing. seeing? Well, oh, so they're both these, They're metamers. This is an example of a metamer. Oh. Oh. So here is a single wavelength of light that you perceive as yellow. Uh -huh. Here are two separate wavelengths of light, one that you perceive as red and one that you perceive as green, but we're shining them both on the same spot. Oh, so, so you it appears. That question. Yeah. I'm here with you now. Okay. okay. I thought you were. You just turned around for a moment. I did. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Is everybody else back? I think so. Okay. All right. So again, it's about creating that same pattern of firing, that same relationship of firing in the three cone types. And there you go, in case you didn't know how to spell cone excitation ratios, it's on the slide for you. I heard cone excitation ratios as one word, so I put cone x, then citation, then ratios. <laughs> okay, that's Let me fix this. <laughs> okay, we'll give you a moment. <laughs> things in like the certain chemicals in like a science class and they turn a different color. Okay. How is how is a chemical going to give off color? Does it work like that or am I asking a really dumb question? Um Yeah. Uh no. So it doesn't really again when you when you're looking at an object, right? <laughs> it's it's about what what wavelengths of light are being reflected to your eye from that. Right. Okay. And what can happen is as the, the properties of that chemical change, it can absorb different wavelengths of light and that's what will change how it what color it, it's it appears to you because it'll change which color it's which wavelengths it's absorbing and which wavelengths it's reflecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that actually it does. Now now that's for most objects, there are things that emit light, right? And I'm assuming this is not something that emits light, because I you know, sometimes you can get things that emit light, right? You create like an explosion or something. Uh, that's that's for things that reflect light. Okay, things that emit light. So if you look at these light bulbs, right? They are their own light source, so they're emitting light, which is a slightly different because right, they're only emitting. They're not really reflecting or absorbing a wavelength of light. They're em emitting that mm -hmm. because they're they're they are a source of light. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. But this is why things appear different. We talked about this maybe briefly. Things appear different to be a different color under fluorescent light versus incandescent bulbs versus outside, right? Because, uh, you know, incandescent bulbs, they have a slightly different signature of uh, wavelengths than uh, fluorescent bulbs or the sunlight, right? So sunlight primarily um, is, is emitting what we would perceive as blue which can help explain why when you look outside and up, you see something that's quite large and typically blue. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's called the sky. Uh -huh. I know, right? 
Um, now, why does the sky turn red in the evenings or in the mornings, right? So what happened? Yeah, you know, Chandler? Are you sure you know or you want to? It refracts the light because the sun's passing past the horizon. Yeah, so, so it stretches the wavelengths of light, right? And so when it stretches, instead of being the shorter things that we perceive as blue, it becomes longer that we perceive as red, right? Because it's coming longer around kind of the curve of the planet instead of coming straight at you through. I was way too excited when I learned that. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> though. Pretty cool. yeah. It's like you just, I see Chloe just. <laughs> Out of Revelation. Yeah, right? <laughs> so that's why that happens. So don't be fooled. Yeah. Alright, so we talked about this, not a big deal. Again, it's that activation pattern across uh, the different uh, cone recept cones that's important. Mm -hmm. There was a guy back in 1777, his name was George Palmer. Uh, he actually sort of figured out how uh, trichromatic color vision works. Why do we call it trichromatic? You have three cone types, right? So three colors, that's trichromatic. Not bad. Uh, most people forgot what Palmer did, and then later there were these other guys, Thomas Young, James Clerk Maxwell, and of course our, our favorite Herman von Helmholtz, um, who, who figured out this stuff sort of again a second time. Don't worry too much about this business, but just know that we have like a dual process. So there's, so how do we get yellow out of this? That's the question, right? If you've got cones that sort of map on to blue, green, and red, but I said there was that fourth, right? How does that guy happen? Uh, that happens by taking the long and medium wavelength cones and adding those <coughs> together and sort of subtracting from that the uh, short wavelength cones. And that's how you come up with yellow. I'm not gonna ask you much about that, but just sort of be aware that that's, that's how that process works. Okay? There we go. Uh, dual process, just that second stage, that's how we get blue-yellow. Typically when we think about color blindness, we will think about red-green color blindness and blue-yellow. The reason it's red-green is, uh, is the most common. The red, so the long wavelength length sensitive cones and the green, the medium wavelength sensitive cones, are very similar genetically, right? They're very similar in terms of their structure. So if you have a small variation in one or the other, it just brings their peaks together. You know, what are they, what wavelength are they most sensitive to? Gabby just brings those closer and closer together. And as they get closer and closer, you can't tell the difference, right? And so it's harder and harder to tell the difference between red and green. This was a problem when I was in high school. My high school color was green. Uh, our, uh, one of our big rivals, their color was red. We had a guy a few years before I played uh, uh, who was colorblind. Because uh, <laughs> my dad has that exact same colorblindness. Yeah. It's only partially colorblind, but it is with greens and reds. Yeah, that's the most common form. Uh, so this guy w was, uh, you know, so we always had to say like, okay, uh, with the other team, you know, if the other team was supposed to wear their dark colored uniforms, we'd have to wear the light, you know, so the guy was, he had some difficulty determining uh, who to throw the ball to. Oh, man, just make that dude a defense. Just, <laughs> yeah, just don't let him don't get in. They can throw the ball. If guys are running at you, hit them. There you go. This was basketball, but okay, okay, Alex. Well, that would make it more interesting. <laughs> it, would, it would. That's true. Make basketball a full contact sport. Yeah. Shoulder pads. Shoulder pads. I'd certainly watch it more. <laughs> well, ratings go up by one. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe instead of the XFL, it should be the XBA, right? Extreme Basketball Association. Nobody thought that was as funny as I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A little creepy, but whatever. <laughs> All right. Oh, here's a fun thing uh, called color contrast. So this is pretty awesome, right? So if you were to, to look at these uh, colors and you were to try to figure out like, you know, which of these is uh, sort of more blue or less blue, right? A lot of that is gonna be influenced by the color that surrounds it, right? And we're gonna do a lab activity that's pretty similar to this. 
right? So you guys will get to experience this firsthand. That's going to be exciting, right? Okay, wait. Can you explain that again? How yeah. So, see how this blue appears much brighter, or much more blue than this particular blue? Uh -huh. In fact, they're they're both the same blue. Okay. Uh, what matters is the surrounding color, right? So this is kind of like. Uh, It's called color contrast. Is that what it's called, right? Yeah, you know all about this, Chloe. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, how many of you think you're tall, but you only think you're tall because everyone in your family spies you tall, right? Right? Has that happened to anybody? I feel attacked. You feel attacked? <laughs> so uh, that's why... It's more blue compared to the yellow. Absolutely, right? So uh, when I hang out with my wife's family, I feel like a giant. Because I, I'm, I'm at least six to eight inches taller than everybody else in her family. Wow. Uh, yeah, she's the second tallest person in her family. Uh, is the dad number one? I mean, she's the tallest person in her family. Uh, and, and then everybody else is a little shorter than she is. And I'm uh, a good bit taller than my wife. Uh, but when I hang out with my family, it's a different story. Uh, in, in fact, I, the only person shorter than me is my mom. Uh, <laughs> my sister's I actually, tried not to laugh. My sister's actually <laughs> taller than I am. And then uh, I got a brother that's like 6'3". So, you know, there's not, not a lot you can do there. You got screwed in the gene pool there, Bob. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it happens. Uh, so, you know, it's just, you know. But you're, My sister's like 5'10". My brother's yeah. 12, and he's 5'4". Yeah. I'm 5'4". Yeah. So there you go, right? What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, he's 12. This is also a kind of a cool diagram uh, demonstration down here. If you look at this ring in the middle that's not purple or orange and you sort of follow that around right what you'll see is that it appears a little bit more green uh, in this section that when it's flanked by orange and a bit more blue perhaps when it's flanked by the purple I don't know if it's the same color all the way around in fact I don't know how well that replicates on the screen can you guys see that mm -hmm. I need to put my head down I feel like my head's gonna so is it originally blue or green the ring yeah is it Blue? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what color it is, right? That's what color it appears to you, right? Because it's all about color contrast. Does that make sense to everybody? Explain that one more time. I don't think I Because, like, half of it looks blue. Right. And half of it looks green. But it's really the same color all the way around. Really? Yes. And it just changes based on... Like it's color contrast, so it changes based on what color it's paired with. Yeah, and but so you would perceive it differently, right? You perceive it, differently. and why might you perceive it differently? Be no, you guys know. The wavelengths are like next to each other. Okay, and if the wavelengths are next to each other, that's going to create a different ratio. Cone excitation ratio, right? And so when you look at the this ring here, and it's flanked by the orange, right? See how much maybe more of the green would get activated relative to, right? Okay, so you're going to perceive that differently because you're getting a different excitation ratio. Not because the ring is giving you a different excitation, but the other cone types are moving up or down around it in terms of activation. And you're going to perceive it differently because you're making that comparison, right? So like the wavelengths are like different strengths like hitting against each other pretty much or like well, they're not necessarily hitting each other they're seeing different cone types okay. and so Olivia this is like a family photo with my wife's family where I, I everybody you know if you were to look at that you would think well that guy he's got to be a giant uh, look look at how small all those other people they're also rather narrow people so, so so not only am I like taller I'm also like wider than everybody else in her family so it's like who is this guy way out of scale and then you put me over in the in the picture with, with my family, you know, and like my, my brother's like six three and you know, here I am, quite a bit shorter than that. You know, like, oh well that that's just like, you know, a shorter person. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. It's not about that ring changing. I didn't change in in either of those photos, it's the people around me changed. Oh, okay, so that's what I was gonna ask. So the ring the ring is staying one. It's the same color. It's the same it, wavelength. It's the same wavelength. That's a better answer. Okay. It's the same wavelength all the way around. But the when you put it with different wavelengths, that's when like the, those cones. The change. other cones get excited, more or less excited. 
and it changes that ratio. So you perceive it differently. Absolutely. See? You guys got it now, right? Yeah. I don't know if this one's going to No, this won't play. Don't worry about this. This is kind of a fun one, though. Uh, what what happens here is this is a um, uh, oh no I don't uh, I didn't mean to do that this is sort of like an, a color after image they just do it with this like sort of moving thing but you don't have to worry about it uh, so basically what happens with a, with an after image is if you were to stare at the, at the center of this, this red dot, and you stare there for long enough and then you look away, what you will probably see is a green inner ring and a red outer ring, right? Did that happen for anybody? Yeah, yeah. I saw the green. But not the red. The red's harder to see because it's bigger and it, and it kind of is out in the periphery. It works better if it's moving because then what you would actually see is the opposite color moving in the opposite direction, which is kind of a it's kind of a cool diagram or Can you demonstration. Tell me about this in my other class, she showed us a picture of like a like a flag and then it would have like yeah. A, yeah yeah they'll do it with the flag sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, there's one with an apple. They'll show you a green apple with a red with a red leaf stare at it and then you look away and you see a red apple with a green leaf. And what happens is, again, this is related to cone excitation ratios, except we're intentionally fatiguing some cones so that when we look away and we look at that white screen, we're forcing activity, even if it's, even if it's baseline activity, right? Because all cones are going to be a little bit active all the time, okay? And if I'm constantly staring at red, then those red cones are going to get tired. And then my green and my blue are going to still stay active, right? So the red gets tired. When I look away, the red is really reduced activity. And then my blue and green are still going to be up there just a little bit active, right? It's just that random activity. So again, because of cone excitation ratios, even though I'm not actively overexciting anymore, those other two cone types, they look like they're much more excited because I've completely fatigued those long wavelength cones, so they're not responding. I think you a perfect way to experience this without damaging yourselves. And you stare at the light for like three seconds and look away, you can see a, the, the fade of like green to blue, but you know, the light itself is, is white. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same idea. Absolutely. Because you are fatiguing one cone type, so any cone types that aren't fatigued are going to appear much more active. And if you're just looking at those ratios, something's more than nothing and you're going to perceive that you're seeing colors that really you're not. That's pretty cool, right? You guys like that? So, yeah. a little question into the psych you know, psychological realm of that. So when people have visual hallucinations, are, they, are there cones being excited, or is that just something else entirely? Uh, I'm going to assume for the most part it's a higher order processing area that's being disrupted. Um, I, I would say if it's a true hallucination, it's not a, um, it's not something going on in the retina. Now there well, are. they know if there's activity within within that realm of things, or yeah, I, I, I mean. I mean, has that even been studied? Like, would we actually know the answer to that? I, I think. There's no way to study it, really. <laughs> well, I mean, you could. Uh, what, what you would want to do is like measure changes in activity. So if you didn't see any abnormal activity patterns in the retina, but let's say you saw an abnormal activity pattern somewhere else in the brain, you could probably assume that whatever, you know, that it was sort of that hallucination was being created elsewhere. Um, however, what I would like to say is there are times when people think they see things, and we've sort of talked about this, like seeing something at night, right? Okay. But in fact, it's really just the structure of your, your rods versus cones and, and that. Now, those things can definitely be sort of a retinal issue, and then you create a story to make sense, right? So, um, you know, a lot of, I know you guys are big ghost hunter fans, uh, right? You guys go out on the weekends, and, you know, commute with Casper and whatnot. Uh, so a lot of the, the folks who go out and they kind of like think they see things, right? Often 
what they're, it's, it's just that sort of, you know, it's a visual trick, really. Um, it's not something that's actually happening. They, they, it's just the limits of your visual system. Uh, people report that they, um, they dream in color. <coughs> and, like, it's just weird because that's, like, I don't know, it's association with that, but your eyes are open when you dream. So, right. like, what? Again, a lot of that's going to be higher order stuff. Okay. If I were to tell okay. you to think about an apple, you guys are going to think about an apple, odds are it's going to be a red apple, right? It's a pretty standard image. Some of you might have thought about a green apple. Somebody may have just eaten a rotten apple, so you know, it's kind of brown. Uh, but there's going to be some color associated with that. That's just tapping into your memories, right? Are you not supposed to dream in color? Is that like a... No, I think that's fine to dream in color. Oh, okay. Just the way she asked the question, like, I just thought, like, oh. I think she was asking, okay, why do you dream in color, color when, in fact, there's no visual input? Oh, okay. But, but, and even, like, sort of more basic question, Chloe, would be, why do you dream at all if there's no visual input? Yeah. Doesn't matter that's, if it's a color right? That's kind of crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> It's just your brain doing stuff. I mean, like, I remember when I was a child, it was weird, but I dreamed that the sky was red for no reason. So, like, that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, dreams don't always make sense, um, or ever. I think that's okay. I think that's like the most psych answer I've ever heard. Yeah, your brain just does stuff. <laughs> your brain just does stuff. <laughs> like, sir, I, I feel this way about this certain thing. Help me. Hey, your brain's just doing stuff, man. I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why I'm not a clinician, because <laughs> that's my answer. Like, your brain's just doing stuff. Write it out. Figure it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think um, hopefully there are folks who can go, well, your brain's doing stuff, um, and here's how this is making you feel, so let's see what we can do differently. Uh, that's, that's somebody else's job. My job's to tell them what your brain's doing. Somebody else's job to figure out how to you know, apply that to a person's life. I think interprets the better word. So there you go. Does that help? Chloe? <coughs> yeah. You guys got it? Great. Uh, da -da -da -da. Prior adaptation. We already talked about that. Not a big deal. Here's sort of this cone excitation ratio business. This is related to adaptation, but I'm not going to really ask you about that. But this is demonstrating to you what's going on when you're looking at this same green patch, right? But again, when you're looking at it over on this side, your other cones are getting super excited, right? And then when you look at it over here, a different set of cones are getting really excited. So it's going to appear differently um, in those two conditions, right? So we really just talked about that. It's just a different way to present it. I think, given how many slides I've spent on cone excitation ratios, I would be prepared to talk about that on the exam. Right, I feel like this is an important concept. I feel so too. Yeah, yeah. I think I think most of you would agree with that, right? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, da -da -da -da, what else do we need to know? We talked about spectral reflectance. Next week we'll talk a little bit more about contact uh, contrast. Basically, whatever the property of the surface of the object is, that's going to affect the spectral reflectance, right? So whatever the, the sort of color of that surface is or whatever wavelengths it absorbs, how reflectant is that surface, right? That's going to make things appear differently to you, okay? So if you were to um, take an object and put it under different conditions, it will appear different because they're also spectral properties of the aluminum, right? Whatever the light source is. So we talked about incandescent bulbs, fluorescent bulbs, and daylight. Right? Because there are different wavelengths of light coming out of each of those light sources, even if it's hitting the same object, it's going to appear slightly different. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is something called color constancy. Right? Even under different lighting conditions, objects appear to be the same color. Right? So if you look at this sort of, uh, you know, these three fruit bowls here, this guy's under artificial light. Here's what we would call hazy daylight. Um, and then here is clear blue sky. Right? And if you look at this, in all three of those, right, you can tell which fruit is which based on color, right? And even though the orange appears different, you know, if you were to just look at the color orange, not the fruit, although it is the fruit as well here, if you looked at that color, you would say, yeah, those are two different colors, but you're saying they're both orange, right? If you looked at this image here, you know, hey, that's that's orange, that's the orange. Here's the yellow banana, right? You can see that even under different lighting conditions, 
uh, objects retain their same color, right? That's true for most things, which is good, right? So, well, what's the well, what's the purpose of this? I mean, Again, this is a cone excitation ratio, right? Because how which cones are getting excited here, relatively speaking, compared to say this pair, is the same ratio that we have in this situation. <laughs> the difference is the light source, right? So, like the uh, cone receptor, like they're the same. I mean, then relatively in the speaking, sense of like, that's how we yeah. keep the same. That's how we have color constancy. That's how things appear the same color, even if they have a different light source, is because the object itself has some properties as to how it reflects and absorbs light, and that's not going to change. Okay. And because it's the same type of light hitting all of the objects in three, all three cases, the difference in each individual image is going to be the difference between the objects, right? So when viewed under different conditions, each object is going to retain its own reflectance properties, okay? And so it's going to be sort of a, uh, we would call it lawful, basically what we would say is, Whatever sort of reflectance properties the pair has here, it's going to have the same properties here and here in comparison to the orange or the lime or whatever fruit you want to pick. Even though the light source changes, it's going to absorb and reflect in the same way. So that's <coughs> why it retains the same color? Yeah. Relative to the other objects. Okay. Because the light source itself changes, the light that, that is available for reflectance and absorb, absorption is different, but it's different for all of the objects in each image. And because it's the, in each image it's the same um, light source, whatever is reflected or absorbed is going to be based upon the object itself. And that's going to be the same across images. Does that make sense? That's a little confusing, I know, but just, just let it marinate. Okay. I get the whole, you know, the the ratio, I get that bit. Yeah. It's just the, the using the pictures, these pictures as examples is a bit confusing. Like I get that, you know, the orange on the far right is going to look darker, <coughs> and the the pear sitting beside on the far right will look brighter. Like I, I understand these things. It's just these pictures are just confusing. So they're not reflecting the different lights any differently, like. Like the light in the first picture is being reflected the same way as the light in the third picture. <coughs> oh, I lost my point. So if you think about this light source, right? Uh -huh. And then let's compare it to this guy over here. Yeah. Okay. This guy over here has more blue. Uh -huh. So everything in that image is going to appear more blue. Uh -huh. All right. But it's all going to appear more blue equally, right? Based on the reflectance of the objects. Because the object's reflectance, they're those, cap those properties didn't change, yeah. right? Now, there's more blue light to reflect, okay? So all of the objects will reflect more blue light, but they're all going to reflect the same ratio of more blue light because the more, more blue light's there. Does that make sense? Does that help? Does that also have to do with, like, you said, like, the property of a surface? Yeah. Like, like, you can see the highlights of the certain like fruits, and like I guess you can tell that like, the banana is a banana just because of the light on it. That's yeah. Bananas aren't quite as reflectant as yeah. They're just like limes, right? There. Yeah. <coughs> Does that make sense to everybody? How many people? How many of you think you have a seventy-five percent understanding of this concept? Okay. Code excitation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. That's fine. Because the lab, I think, will help a little bit with that and then we'll, we'll get you all the way through, okay? <coughs> all right, color deficiencies, let's talk about that. Uh, there are basically two ways you can have um, color deficiencies. You could completely be missing a cone type, or you could have a cone type, but its spectral sensitivity is shifted one way or the other. So you might have all three cone types, but they're just not spaced in the way that they are for most people, right? So two of them would be closer. You could be completely missing one as well. Okay. 
So what we call an anomalous trichromat is somebody who has all three cone classes, but again, that sensitivity is shifted, that peak shifted one way or the other, okay? <coughs> Folks who we would call a dichromat, that's when you're actually missing one of the cone photopigments, okay? So, so that we, we that you just like, can't see a color altogether? Right, right. And so what happens is the other cones will get excited, right? Because all cones get excited by all wavelengths of light. It just matters how much more do they, again, that excitation ratio, right? And so whichever cone, other cone type gets the most excited, that's kind of where you would perceive that color. Does that make sense? So this happens with folks who are red, who are red green color blind, right? So let's say you're completely missing those medium wavelength, that medium wavelength photopigment. So that's, that's going to be all you perceive as green. So when you look at something that's green, all you have left are the long and the short wavelength. The long wavelength is going to get more excited than the short wavelength. So you would perceive it as red, the same as you would red. Yeah. Does that make sense? A lot of folks who are in this anomalous trichromatic category, they have trouble with reds and greens as well. They'll perceive a lot of those as brown, right? Because the red and the green uh, cone types will each be getting equally excited. And sometimes they'll, they'll kind of just think everything in that category is a brown. It's kind of weird. Does that make sense? Most of the folks who are colorblind or have color deficiencies are males. That's because the gene for uh, cone types is on the X chromosome, right? Males only get one of those, so you have to use it because there's other important stuff on there. Females get two of those, so if one of those is screwed up, you can use the other one, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, so for a female to be colorblind, it's kind of rare because both X chromosomes would have to have a problem with these uh, cone type genes. <coughs> Does that make sense? I actually went to high school with a girl who was colorblind. I didn't realize like how cool it was at the time. Uh, I just thought, well, she's the girl who always wears brown pants. She said she said all of her she bought all of her like had someone help her, but all of her clothes matched. Her like pants, like all the shirts she owned matched the pants she owned. That way it didn't matter which shirt or pants she pulled out of the closet, they would match. Because she had no way to know. It's kind so of she was uh, anom anomalous? Um, you, you know, I think she probably was. Uh, you know, I, I didn't get, unfortunately think about giving her a color vision test at the time. I wish I had. <laughs> uh, going back on it. One of like two regrets I have in my life. What's the other one? What's the other one? <laughs> uh, <laughs> teaching this Getting class. A cat. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a cat. Getting a cat. All right. Things to remember, things to forget. No worries there. Questions, comments, concerns.